I'm Don. Welcome to Restoration Church and our Good Friday service. We are thrilled that you're here, and it's just an honor and pleasure to see everybody tonight. So in our call to worship, I want to I want to talk about Matthew 27. So we're going to go over that text. And just a little near context of Matthew 27, and we're going to start in 32 to 50. But this is these are the closing this day represented the closing hours of our of our Lord Jesus Christ's ministry, right? So he was delivered up to Pilate in Matthew in Matthew 27. So that that happened, you know, early early in the morning. This morning it would have been on a on a on a timeline uh, that we're on leading up to our Lord's Day this Sunday. So he's turned over to Pilate. All the, 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 the false trials, the scourging, all those things happen. Judas realizes his error, goes out and hangs himself. Uh, again, Christ is before Pilate. In that time, they would release a prisoner, and so they present Christ to the, to the, to the crowd and again, as Pastor said last week, millions of people are in Jerusalem. So the crowd is worked up. They release a criminal named Barabbas instead of Christ, and they demand that Christ be crucified. So that leads us up to verse 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry the cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, it would, he would not drink it. And then, they, and then they had crucified him. They divided his garments among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews, then the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. This is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come down to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Let me pray for us, and we'll uh, bring the pastor up. Father, we thank you for this Good Friday. It is good because the work is finished. Your mission is finished, and you have redeemed sinners like me. And we just thank you so much for your sacrifice. Uh, Lord, we just ask you bless our service this, this evening, and Lord, we uh, look forward to being in your house on Sunday. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's stand, guys. If you know the song, sing it. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame. Bearing shame and scoffing root in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon. Hallelujah, what 
pursued. Y'all can sing it, come on. It is finished was his bride. Now in heaven, exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. Let us bow our heads for prayer, Lord, we thank you. We serve such a good Savior, a faithful Savior who went to the cross for my sin, for the sins of the world. What else can we say, Lord, but hallelujah, what a Savior, amen. As we survey the wondrous cross tonight, God, I pray that we would see the sinless spotless Savior who took my place. May we be in awe, Lord, tonight of the sacrifice you made for us so that we might be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, so that we might be reconciled to a holy God. Thank you, Lord. Sing it out. I serve
your voice, this church. Let us sing out to the Savior. Let us make much of his great love tonight. Lay down his life for us. Sing it. We're singing is my Savior's love for me that would take my shame my guilt and my sin and be nailed to a criminal's cross the sinless spotless holy Lamb of God takes the place where sinners lay did that for us tonight so that we might approach this great throne of God and find at this throne uh, not justice, not wrath, but grace, and mercy. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you would overwhelm our hearts with truth tonight, the truth of what you've done for us to reconcile us. God, and I pray that you would lead many sons to glory tonight. May we reevaluate re our hearts. May we examine them, Lord, to see if this is the song of our heart, Lord. If this is what we're singing tonight as we come to the cross. Are we singing how marvelous? Are we singing oh, how wonderful? Is that the song of the hearts of your people? I pray that it is, Lord, because it is marvelous. It is wonderful as we survey the wonderful cross. We pray all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, praise the Lord. I'm so grateful to be here gathered with you. Um, if you have your Bibles, if you could turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Um, if we think about the religious leaders and the Jews at that time, um, they were expecting a leader to come in get rid of all the governments and entities that were over the people and establish a sovereign nation. But what they didn't see, that there was a greater need than a government entity over them. There was a need for a savior. There was a need for them to be made right with a holy and righteous God. And so we see here in the book of Isaiah... He prophetically speaks here of Jesus, and I pray as we read through this that we would think about who our Savior was, and we think about what our Savior has done to think that my sin drove Christ to the cross. But out of his great love, he made a way that sinners can be reconciled with God. We don't deserve it. We did nothing to earn it, but it's by God's grace and mercy. And he calls all those who will come and repent of their sin and turn to Christ, that you would be saved. That that wrath of God that you should receive for your sin is placed on Christ on the cross. And so as we look in this passage, we see that our sins are forgiven by this Christ, this Messiah, who came so that we can be made right with God. So please uh, turn with me to Chapter 53, starting at verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, 
and we esteemed him not. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he, did, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of God, the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you. You could have came to this world as, as a king that is reigning. You could have came to this world as a political leader you could have came to this world as as anything lord but you came as a servant you said i didn't come to be served but to serve and you gave of your life for sinners like us for bad people like us ones that we reject god we desire to be self-sovereign we want to be in control of our lives we want to dictate how we do church and how we see your word, but by your grace and your mercy, you made a way for us. That you not only transform us, but you give us of your very Holy Spirit. God, that you give us your word so that we might understand who you are. God, we might understand the weight of what you have done. I pray, Lord, as the word is being preached and as we come before the Lord's table, I pray that we would feel the weight that Christ felt. That the wrath of God fully being poured out on him for my sin. Lord, I pray we would feel that weight. God, please be with Pastor Arthur. Work through the word. I pray the, the, the hearts of stone that might be here today, Lord, I pray that you would make them a heart of flesh. God, give them ears to hear and eyes to see. And Lord Jesus, do the work only you can do. Please help us, remind us of this glorious day where you were crushed for our iniquities. And Lord, we know that the day came where you rose from the grave, where you declared victory over sin and death that I know that when I trust in you, should this be my last day, I have hope that when I breathe my last breath and I close my eyes for the final time, I will see my Savior. So Lord, help us work in Pastor Arthur. Let the hope of the gospel, Lord, transform us. In your mighty name, Jesus, I pray and give thanks. Amen. So happy to uh, welcome all of you on this Good Friday tonight. 
And that includes uh, some of you who are visiting with us. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. Our church is honored to have you. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't invite you to Easter this Sunday. And so if you're here and you're our guest, and, or maybe you're online and, and uh, you just couldn't make it tonight, we just want to invite you to our Sunday service right here at 1030. Uh, it's, a, it's a blessing of God that we don't have to set up on Sunday. We get to leave all of this up. Um, we're just thankful to the Lord for that. And uh, I would also challenge our church um, tonight as we leave. Um, we have invite cards for Easter. You know what? Just invite one person to church. Um, just one changed life is all we're, we're praying for one, for the one who will hear the word and respond. Amen. But for tonight, as we prepare our hearts for a time around the Lord's table, I want you to open up your copy of God's word to Hebrews chapter 4, if you can, starting at verse 14 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. No matter how many times I've preached through the years on the cross and the sacrifice of Christ, I have found the scripture to be an inexhaustible treasure of truth relating to the sacrifice of our Savior. The sacrifice of our Savior of, Savior, of course, is, as we know, the theme of all of Scripture. And so it's found in many ways and in many places in the Bible. But tonight I want you to look at just three verses, three verses at the end of the fourth chapter of Hebrews tonight. And I want to read them to you if I can. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and then, and then we're going to have a moment of prayer. This is the word of God, the very breath of God. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful tonight for the love that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus. Whoever believes in him tonight and what he's done for us with his life and with his death and with his resurrection, the Bible says we can have the forgiveness of sins and eternal salvation. But as Jeremy prayed, we need you. As Jesus, when he was talking to Nicodemus and Nicodemus was wondering how all of this makes sense. And he says, it doesn't make sense unless you are born again. Only those who have eyes to see can see the kingdom of God. And so tonight, Lord, open up our eyes. What we know not teach us. What we have not give us. And what we are not yet, Lord, make us. God, I pray that this narrative, this account of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, I pray tonight that it would fall afresh upon our hearts. May we be in wonder and, and in awe tonight of what you've done. We love you, Lord, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the first part of our service, we were intentional in considering the cross. Our music tonight was an invitation to look at the cross. And there certainly was in that music sadness and, and sympathy and even heartbreak for those of us who understand the agonies and the sufferings of our Savior on the cross. But I want to submit to you tonight that Good Friday is more than an invitation to sympathy. I want to submit to you tonight that Good Friday is more than an invitation to view the past. You see, my dear friends, Good Friday should be viewed as an invitation to salvation. 
really, every single time we meet together and exalt the Lord Jesus, that in and of itself becomes an invitation to salvation. The forgiveness of sins, the escape from divine judgment and eternal punishment, and the gift of everlasting life and the glories of heaven. The crucial reality in looking at the cross is not simply to see the physical features of the cross or the things that were going around the cross, that were going on around the cross. As important and as significant as those things are, it's more than that. The important thing to see, my dear friends, when you look at the cross, I want you to see the spiritual significance of it. And what I love about the passage we are reading tonight is it shows us that. It helps us to see tonight the spiritual significance of the cross. So this passage is not just an invitation to look at the event of the cross tonight. I want to submit to you on this day that Good Friday and the cross is an invitation to look at Christ himself and what he accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago. This is an invitation tonight. And the invitation tonight is really twofold. I want you to look at verse 14. At the end of verse 14, it says this, let us hold fast our confession. Do you see that? And at the beginning of verse 16, it says, let us then with confidence draw near. Do you see it? Two commandments. Really, it's two invitations. The first one is let us hold fast to our confession. And the second one is let us then with confidence draw near. You see, the second invitation assumes a statement of trust in Christ. So we can read these verses this way. Since you have made a confession, let us then with confidence draw near. Y'all probably know Romans 10, 9. Some of you may have learned it and have hidden it in your heart. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the author of Hebrews is thus saying that if you've made a confession, listen to me now, the author of Hebrews is saying, if you made a confession, you have formally been invited to cling to that confession and to hold on to that confession. And the second invitation is this. If you've made that confession, my dear friends, draw near with confidence. And this drawing near with confidence indicates a moving ahead to the future. And so the question for us is, what is that all about? What is that talking about? Well, my dear friends, I want to submit to you that this is looking at someone who's been convinced of the truth of the gospel and to some degree confessed its integrity or its validity and its accuracy, but for some reason or another has not come all the way to full faith in Christ. And I have to say this morning that this is probably the most dangerous place to be, to be caught in the middle convinced it's true and perhaps you've even affirmed that the gospel is true that Jesus is who he said he was and he died the death that scripture says he died and he rose from the dead and you don't dispute that you don't deny that you affirmed that confession but you have not taken the step to draw near so the author of Hebrews is saying to you this evening, my dear friends, don't let go of your confession. Keep going. Draw near with confidence. The same language is used in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. It's literally identical, just in reverse. Let me show it to you. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through 24. It says, let us... Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is, y'all can help me preach, is faithful. I know it's hot in here, so if you help me preach, it'll help you burn some calories tonight. But this becomes a pattern in the book of Hebrews. It's, it's kind of like an instruction and a warning in the book of Hebrews. You'll see it all over. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 says it this way. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. It's the same thing. This is really what the book of Hebrews is all about. In chapter 2, and in chapter 3, and in chapter 4, and in chapter 6, all the way through chapter 10, the author of Hebrews is essentially saying, my dear brother and sister in Christ, come all the way to Christ. Come all the way to Christ and don't stop. Come all the way. And in these little verses, in Hebrews 4, the author of Hebrews, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he gives us three reasons why the believer should hold on to his confession and come all the way to Christ tonight. And they really just relate to one main reason that's found in verse 14. Verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 4 says, Since then... We have a what? A great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. That's the very same reason why we are to draw near with confidence. Why, Pastor Arthur? Because of him called the one in verse 15. Why come all the way? Why? Why hold fast to the confession? Why draw fully near to Christ? And I'll give you the answer. Because Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the reason to hold fast. Jesus is the reason to draw near. Why? Because he has no parallel. Jesus has no equal, my dear friends. He has no competition. There is no match for Jesus, the Son of God. So the whole book of Hebrews is designed to illustrate the absolute superiority of Jesus, the Son of God. All through this book, we are told that he is better than the prophets. He is better than the patriarchs. He is better than the noblest of all Old Testament leaders. He is better than the priests. He is better than the angels. I get what you're trying to say, the author of Hebrews. He's better than everyone. He's better than everyone. Jesus has no parallel. He has no equal. And when it boils down to it, there is no one, don't miss what I'm saying now, there is no one who can provide and offer what Christ offers. Our suffering Savior offers to us tonight a better sacrifice, a better covenant with better promises. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about, my dear friends. Christ, the humble and suffering servant, offers to us a relationship with a holy God that is everlasting and filled with eternal joy. Listen, we can't mess this up on Good Friday. Christianity is about none other than Christ. Christianity isn't about ethics it isn't about morals, and it isn't about virtues. It's about Christ. We would never say to someone, become a Christian because of its ethical value. Become a Christian because of its moral value. Become a Christian because of its virtues. Become a Christian because you can hang around some nice people, and we have a lot of them here. Become a Christian because we're charitable, and you'll be a part of something bigger than yourself to make a difference in the world. No, when the rubber meets the road, there's only one reason to become a Christian, and that's to embrace Jesus, the Son of God. Because at the end of the day, I think you and me know this, many religions can offer ethical improvement and moral improvement. They offer virtue and charity. 
But only Jesus Christ tonight offers forgiveness for sin and salvation. He's the only one. No one else does. Jesus' words were pretty straightforward when he says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And no one. Did he say maybe there's some people that can get through somehow? Kind of how y'all cut through traffic oftentimes? No. He says no one comes to the Father but by me. So the writer of Hebrews, he's got his mind made up. And he says, draw near tonight. Come all the way. Don't shrink back. Don't let go of the confession that you have made. Come all the way to Christ because he alone offers forgiveness for sins and offers eternal salvation. That's why you should come. There's no salvation in any other tonight. You see, my dear friends, sinners require a savior. Sinners require a mediator. Sinners require a priest who can actually bring them to God. A reconciler who can join sinful man, you and me, and a holy God and bring them together. I love what Paul told young Timothy. He says, Timothy, don't, don't ever forget this one thing. For there is one God. And there is one mediator between God and man and men, the man, Christ Jesus. <laughs> the Bible makes it clear that Jesus is the only mediator, despite what our Catholic friends think. He is the unequaled mediator. And tonight, I want to briefly give you three reasons why Jesus is the only mediator and the only reconciler for sinful men. First and foremost, it's because he's a perfect priest. Verse 14, it says something so great. Verse 14 says, we have a great high priest. I want you all to read that with me. We have a great high priest. What in the world does the author of Hebrews mean when he gives Jesus the title of a great high priest? Well, if you haven't picked up on the theme already, what the author of Hebrews is saying, that Jesus is unmatched. He's unparalleled. He's superior. He's perfect. He's flawless. He transcends all other priests that have come before him. And by the way, there were tens of thousands of priests in Judaism in the Old Testament. Many Many, many priests, but tonight the author of Hebrews says, but there's only one great high priest. So the question that we have to ask as good Bible studiers is this, what sets Jesus apart? I want you to notice verse 14 because he tells us, he says, hey, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Oh, boy. I don't think y'all y'all haven't understood the passage yet, but hopefully we'll get there tonight. I believe that this is one of the most important statements made in the entire book of Hebrews, in the entire book of, or the uh, the entire New Testament, and in the Old Testament. Because every single priest in the economy of Israel passed through something. All earthly priests pass through certain barriers, pass through certain curtains, whether it was in the tabernacle or the temple or whatever temple was built at whatever time in Israel history, they had to pass through certain areas. They had to pass through certain areas for one reason, to finally arrive at the presence of God. Not the literal presence of God, the symbolic presence of God in the Holy of Holies. So all the earthly high priests went into the Holy of Holies, entered only once a year, Yom Kippur, right? The Day of Atonement. And they had to sprinkle the blood of a sacrificed animal and leave immediately or else they would die on the spot because they were sinners. But these priests, they passed into a tabernacle made by men on earth. 
They passed into the Holy of Holies in that tabernacle or in the temple constructed by men, which is just symbolic of the presence of God. But at the end of the day, the earthly high priests, they never got beyond the earthly temple. Never. They went through three areas. I think I have pictures of Solomon's temple. Is it up there? And I just want to show you, because just so you can see it, 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 it might be there. I'm almost certain, but, you know, when, when, when Trenton shakes his head, we're all in trouble, all right? But no need to fear. I'll just, I'll just let you know what the areas are, all right? They first started in the court. In the temple court is where the sacrifices were made. All right, y'all pay attention over here. In the temple court is where the sacrifices were made. And then the, the high priest, they would then go into the holy place. And then after that, they would go into the holy of holies to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. So there were three barriers, three areas that the high priest had to pass through. And the high priest couldn't go into the holy of holies until, this is important, he had offered a sacrifice for his own sins. Which speaks of the reason why he had to get out of the presence of God as fast as he got in. So what he did is he came into the Holy of Holies, got the blood, sprinkled it on the mercy seat, and he's gone. And I tell you what was not in the Holy of Holies. There was not a chair in the Holy of Holies. There was not a bench in the Holy of Holies. There was nowhere to sit. But our great high priest... He didn't pass through a curtain in a tent. He didn't pass through a curtain in a building. I, I don't want y'all to miss this. He passed through the heavens, y'all. Plural. And now some of y'all are thinking, what in the world does that mean, the heavens? Well, I'm glad I could read your mind tonight. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven. The second heaven is the stellar heaven, and the third heaven is the eternal abode of God. Now, I just want you to understand what's taking place. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the great high priest, he went through the atmospheric heavens, and then he went through the stellar heavens into the eternal abode of God, presented his own bloodshed on the cross to sprinkle on the heavenly mercy seat, according to Hebrews 12, 24, and then he did what no other priest had done before. What did he do? Y'all help me out now. What did he do? He sat down. He sat down. And I have to encourage you tonight. He's still there. <laughs> he never got back up. He is still there in the presence of God. You see, my dear friends, Jesus offered a sacrifice before he went in to the presence of God. But the sacrifice was not for himself. I want you all to know that. But it was for us. It was for us. You see, he did what no other priest had ever done before. He stayed not in the symbolic presence of God, but in the real presence of God, in the glory of heaven. And I love this because the book of Hebrews makes so much out of this. It's almost like the author of Hebrews couldn't stop talking about it. So let me show you all the verses he mentions in it. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews chapter 7, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Hebrews 8, 1, now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Hebrews chapter 9, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. 
For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a defiled persons with the ashes of heifer sanctify for the purifications of the flesh, how much more were the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve a living God. Hebrews 9, 24, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true thing, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Verse 25, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. No, no, no. Verse 28, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Hebrews is making a case that Jesus sat down and finished the work for sinners. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, what did he do, church? He sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down. He sat down. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Look into Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What a glorious truth that is for us on this Good Friday. This is what Good Friday is all about. We have a Savior who's accomplished everything for us. And the fact that we know that that God is pleased with that sacrifice and that the work is finished, how do we know that, Pastor Arthur? Because he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Many, many, many times through the book of Hebrews, the emphasis is made on the completion of Christ's work. He wants us to know 2,000 years later by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the work for our sins, for us to be reconciled back to God, the work is done. There is no need for another priest to sacrifice again. Jesus was the fully acceptable sacrifice and priest who entered into the heavens into the very presence of God. That's exactly what verse 14 is saying tonight. Jesus was the perfect priest who passed through the heavens and took his own blood, as it were, into the very holy of holies in heaven itself and brought satisfaction to God, and he stayed there to ever live and intercede for his own. Why hold on to your confession? Why? Why draw near in full assurance of faith? Because, my dear friends, there is only one Christ and only one perfect priest tonight. But the reason he's a perfect priest, I have to submit to you tonight, is because he's a perfect person. Look again at verse 15. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, right? But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet... Y'all say it with me. Yeah, without sin. Without sin. The countless gallons of blood that ran all over the temple altars for centuries, the sprinkled blood that stained the mercy seat year after year could not take away sin because it was animal blood. So y'all get this now. The great high priest... As man shed his own blood for man, you and me. And as God, he triumphed in the midst of the wrath of God. And he came out of that grave gloriously as our perfect prophet, priest, and king. Redemption accomplished. And the king took his seat. But as a man, you know that The Bible depicts Jesus as 100% 
man and 100% God. Or fully God, fully man. Truly God, truly man. However, whatever one you want to stick with, they all mean the same thing. But we have to understand that as a man, Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses tonight. Jesus is able to understand us and what we're going through. This is how he can have full sympathy for us. He came into this world as a man and he suffered all the things that humans suffer to sympathize with us, yet without sin. And he had to be a man to die in our place to have full sympathy. But he also had to be God in the midst of all of that suffering to never sin. So the sinless, spotless, without blemish sacrifice tonight is also the perfect priest. So the Holy Spirit, through the author of Hebrews, is saying tonight to every single person in this room and the, person, and the people that are watching online, he's saying, draw near and hold on to your confidence. Why? Draw near and hold on to your confidence. Why? Because Jesus is the perfect priest and because he's the perfect person. And then finally, the perfect priest, who is the perfect person, Scripture shows us in verse 17, he made the perfect provision. He says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace tonight that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I love that verse. If you want to do an interesting study of Scripture, go to the Old Testament. You can go all the way back to the Old Testament, places like Psalm 89, 14, where it says that righteousness and justice speaking to God are the foundation of God's throne. You can go back to Ezekiel chapter 1, and here's what you're going to see. You're going to see the fury and judgment and fiery wrath being stirred up at the throne of God about to be unleashed on sinful men. You can go to the book of Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 4. This is your homework tonight. And see a vision of the throne of God, almost identical to the vision in Ezekiel 1. You can go to the great white, white throne at the end of the book of Revelation. And I'll tell you what you will find at that great white throne. Here's what you're going to find. You're going to find a throne of judgment, a throne of justice, and a throne of wrath. Why? Because the blood of animals couldn't pacify the wrath of God. The blood of animals couldn't satisfy the perfect justice of God, and the blood of animals could not change a judgment throne. But hear me, but, but because of what the priest, the perfect priest, who is the perfect person did, you notice in verse 16 that we can draw near not to a throne of justice and not to a throne of judgment and not to a throne of wrath, but to a throne of what tonight? Oh, I know, maybe y'all haven't got to a throne of what tonight? A throne of grace. Grace. Y'all, I don't know if you got this tonight, but Jesus transformed the throne. He literally transformed the throne. So where we go and what we receive when we go to this throne and when we trust in the precious sacrifice of Jesus and the blood that was shed for us, when we go to this throne as Christians, here's what we find, mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Praise be to God. If you're going to hoot and holler, that's the moment, that's the spot. So the author of Hebrews says, let us then parousia in the Greek draw near to the throne of grace. You know what that word means, parousia in the Greek? That's confidence. You know what that means? In absence of fear. Let us then, with absence of fear, draw near to the throne of grace. The author of Hebrews is essentially telling us, hey, Christian, don't worry about what you're going to say. Come to the throne of grace without fear and say anything. It also means, there's a, a, another sub-definition of it, it means a, a freedom of speech, openness of speech. In other words, what the author of Hebrews is telling us tonight is that Christians can now go into the holy of holies before a holy God and say anything. We can go into the presence of God anytime we want and say whatever is on our hearts without fear. 
Ah, man, this is incredible. We who are in Christ tonight, who have believed in the Lord Jesus, we can approach a holy God without fear. All that Christians will ever find at the throne of God is grace and mercy. All we will ever find as beloved, adopted children of God is mercy. Why? Because Jesus paid for all of your sins. He paid for all of your iniquities. He paid for all of your transgressions. Every single last one of them. Your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. So the author of Hebrews says tonight, I hope that you see this. And once you see it, once you get a glimpse of this truth, once you get a glimpse of this reality, hey, my dear brother, hold fast to your confession. And don't shrink back. Come all the way to Christ tonight. Come tonight without fear, knowing that the perfect priest, the perfect person, made a perfect provision for you and me to be made right with God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we hallow your name tonight. And Father, we ask tonight that as we come, I pray that we would think again about the cross and about what you have provided in the sacrifice of your son, that we would first and foremost examine ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith, whether we are in that halfway ground or whether we've come all the way, all the way to fully embrace Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray tonight for those who may be tempted to fall back to destruction. Bring them all the way to your son, Jesus. We thank you for Christ's mighty work on the cross tonight. We thank you that he passed through the heavens into your eternal abode, having offered his blood as a fitting sacrifice in Jesus. We thank you that before God, you were accepted, exalted, and enthroned. And you sat down at the right hand. The majesty on high, forever glorified, forever exalted, forever honored. The final sacrifice ever to be made. So, Lord, I just pray for all those who are here that they wouldn't walk away from this singular provision of reconciliation with you through the one and only mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of us tonight who are believers, may our hearts tonight be refreshed in looking again at these most beloved of all truths that fill our hearts, Lord, with joy and hope. And as we come tonight to your precious table, may we lament and rejoice. May there be sorrow and joy as we consider your sacrifice and your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Men, why don't you come up to the front, those who will be handing out the elements tonight. We have the privilege on this Good Friday to come to the table. Church, it is a privilege and an honor that Jesus had to sacrifice for us to come to the table. We understand that, right? But it's extra special tonight as we consider the weight of what Christ has done for us. But I must be clear tonight that the partaking of the Lord's Supper is really for certain people that meet two very important requirements. To come to the Lord's table, the Bible is clear. We must repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says that one must be born again to have communion with him. To come to the table means that you are in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That you've believed, you've repented, you've believed in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. My dear friend, if you've never done that before, hey, tonight's the night. Here's what, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do tonight. Tonight, I want you to let the elements pass by you. If you've never trusted in Christ, 
I want you to let them pass by you. I want you to call on the name of Christ to save you. And the Bible says if, if, if we believe in our hearts and if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he rose from the grave, the Bible says we can be saved. So come all the way to Christ tonight. Hold on to the confession. But tonight, if you haven't believed in Jesus and you're not ready to take that step, that's okay. I want you to do it. That's okay. Just let the plates just pass by you. And the second requirement is this. It's for the Christian. You see, the Lord's Supper is such a perfect time to reflect on whether or not we are living a life of repentance. You see, we're all sinners, yet we don't have glorified bodies yet. So that means that we all fall short of the glory of God. But the table is for those who are living a life of penitence and repentance. Who are fighting and battling against sin by coming to the Lord. And when we fall short, we confess. But if there are people who are in this room tonight who are not battling with sin. Who maybe confess that they're. Christians, but they're living in sin. They're not living a life of repentance. Or maybe you are here tonight and from another church and you're under church discipline. Or maybe you are harboring unforgiveness against a brother or sister in Christ. What I would ask you is allow the plates to just pass by you tonight and use this time to go before God and confess your sins and repent of your sins, and trust on Jesus. This is the night to be able to think of that person whom you know in your heart you haven't forgiven. Will you go before the Lord tonight and forgive them in your heart as you allow these plates to pass by you? But if you are a believer in Christ tonight, you are walking in fellowship with Jesus and you're walking in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, tonight we invite you to come to the table and commune with God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this sacrifice. We thank you, God, as we learn tonight, it costs you your life. You endured the cross for the joy set before you. But you endured the cross for us. So tonight, God, I just pray that as we consider the cross, as we survey the wondrous cross, I pray that tonight, Lord, that we would have a clear picture of the gospel, a clear picture of what You did for us. You lived a life we could never live. You died in our place. And on the third day you rose. May we glory in your sacrifice tonight. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Men you come up.
The Bible says, For I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want you to sing this with me. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Sing it out. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, we thank you tonight. We are especially grateful tonight for those nailed, pierced hands, those nails that went through your feet, for the blood that was shed and the body that was broken for us. We love you, Lord. We're so thankful for your sacrifice. We're so thankful that you paid it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the Bible says, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want you to sing this with me. What can wash away my sin? Y'all singing now. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing this one. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. Let us pray. May we use this time as a reflection time. Let's just maybe have 10 to 15 seconds just to just to reflect, just to be in awe right now.
Lord, thank you for the blood that was shed. Lord, thank you for reminding us again 2,000 years later on this Good Friday, 2022. That the sacrifice that was made is sufficient. And we know that the work is done. How? Because Jesus, our great high priest, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Not only did he say it is finished on the cross, but he showed us that it was done by sitting down. The work is done. That anyone who would come to him and trust in him can have the forgiveness of sins tonight and eternal life. Lord, as we consider the old rugged cross tonight and end our time with a time of worship, God, I just pray that you would move in our hearts, Lord. Work in our hearts tonight by your spirit. May we be humbled by what you've done. But God, more than just being humbled, <laughs> may it cause us, Lord, to run out of these doors and tell the world what Jesus did for us. He died. He rose again. And Lord, we are excited to celebrate on Sunday that you are very much alive, that you live to make intercession for your people. Thank you, Lord, for this time tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together if we can. We're going to sing a very familiar song to close our time. If you know it, sing it with us.
praising him. Come on, he is worthy. He is worthy. Well, church, I am excited to celebrate Sunday. Am I the only one who's excited to celebrate Sunday? I am looking forward to our time. Uh, man, we don't have to set up. We just get to come into the house. The tomb is empty. We get to worship Christ, and I am so excited. So here's the thing. We're doing something after church to those who want to come. We're going to Steak and Shake in Sanford, okay? Yes, I'm inviting everybody. So I, I called them in advance. I said, we were coming. Get the shakes ready. Get the fries ready. Get those greasy burgers ready because we are coming to break our fast tonight. Um, so, y'all, if you need directions or if you want to follow somebody, you can follow me, okay? I got a white Dodge journey you can follow, okay? But let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We are grateful for you. Thank you, Lord, for blessing our time, Lord. We look forward, Lord, to Sunday, Lord, Resurrection Sunday, where we will celebrate your victory over sin and over death. And, God, I pray that you would encourage our hearts tonight, Lord. For the weary, God, give us rest, Lord. For the morning, comfort us, Lord. And for those who need strength, prop us up tonight and remind us that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Lord, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.